Well, I'm going to be preaching a message today called The First Disciples. And you'll find out why I'm sharing on this as we wrap up towards the end. We've got a special morning this morning and we're going to come and have a special time. And uh, I believe it's a time where God's uh, going to minister into the lives of some people this morning. Uh, But hopefully God can speak to each and every one of us today. We've got a little bit of a ring there. If we can just pull that down just a little bit, that would be good. Yeah. Everybody still hear me okay? All right. Just need a little bit more fallback if I can, mate, so I don't thrash my voice. I want to read a passage of scripture this morning. It's out of the book of Matthew. It's where Jesus did call the first disciples. And it's an interesting passage of scripture here because really if you look at it in the context of today or even back in those days, if you don't understand what was going on, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And it's this scripture and it says, as he was walking, talking about Jesus by the shore, of Lake Galilee, Jesus noticed two fishermen who were brothers. One nicknamed Kepha, later called Peter, and the other was Andrew, his brother, watching as they were casting their nets into the water. Jesus called out to them and said, Come follow me, and I will transform you into men who catch people for God. Immediately, they dropped their nets and left everything behind to follow Jesus. Leaving there, Jesus found three other men sitting in a boat, Mending their nets, two of them, brothers, James and John. And they were with their father, Zebedee. Jesus called Jacob and John to their side, or James and John to their side, and said, Come to me and follow me. And at once they left their boat and their father and began began to follow Jesus. Now, what doesn't make sense in that scripture? If you're a business owner here today, maybe you own a a particular business in town you might sell goods and you've got a vacancy at your shop and you walk down the street and you need a worker and you walk past somebody that's sitting on the side of the street that you might not think's got a job and you go up to them and say hey come and follow me I've got a job for you wouldn't that be good if they just got up and followed you and went and worked for you could you imagine that But that's what happened. Jesus came to these guys. It says they weren't just fishing by the river. It says they were fishermen. It was making a distinction here between just going out and throwing a line in on the weekend recreational fishing, which is just about finished now, as we've worked out just recently. But we've got fishing. They weren't just fishermen as far as fishing on the weekend. That was their trade. That was their livelihood. That was the... um, thing that had been passed down to them by their father and from the generations. And yet Jesus just walked by, seen these men that were there in their occupation, and he said, come follow me. And they just dropped everything and went and followed him. Why did they do that? He turned around and he didn't even have a job description. He didn't say where they were going. He didn't say how long they'd be there. He didn't tell them about the hourly pay rate of being a disciple or a follower of Jesus. There was no discussion how long to follow him for. There was no other information but follow me. What a terrible sales pitch if you looked at it in the natural. You just said, follow me. Uh, well, why? Where are we going? You know, if somebody you were, if you were sitting at the park bench and somebody walked past and said, follow me, are you going to get up and just follow them? Think about it today. There's got to be more to this story than just follow me. The reason behind this is that back in those days, every Hebrew boy didn't necessarily want to be an influencer on YouTube. Hello? Or an Instagram person getting a whole heap of likes that wasn't the dream they didn't even want to be football stars or basketball stars they weren't even interested in AFL back then every young man that was around at that time their greatest desire or their family's desire for them or the greatest echelon of what they could be would have been called a rabbi a teacher or somebody that was that was a person of authority but very few young people ever made it to become a rabbi there was such, such a strict criteria to becoming a rabbi. Think about this. We want to teach our children a few memory verses. So we'll get our scripture, John 3.16, sit down, and we'll take them through that, and we'll try and teach them. And 
if they can quote John 3.16 and a few other scriptures, by the time they're five or six, we're going, hey, look at that. We take them out. Visitors come over to have dinner here. Johnny, get up. Quote a particular scripture. And they'll quote it out. And you go, mate, that's exciting, isn't it? And they'll go, far out. That kid knows the word of God. He's getting that into him. Understand this. If you wanted to be a rabbi, by the age of six, you have to know Leviticus off by heart. Anybody read Leviticus lately? <laughs> Maybe if you had to do one of the smaller books or something like that, but Leviticus is not the easiest book to start on and probably not that interesting for kids either, really, if you think about it. But that was the first test. If they were going to go on to their next stage, the second stage, they had to know Leviticus by the age of six. And a, a rabbi would stand there and start reading Leviticus from any part of Leviticus and he would stop and that child had to continue on from where he stopped and continue to quote until he told him to stop. Think about that. That's a fair sort of a challenge, isn't it? And if you made it to the age of six and you qualified to the next level, that gave you six years to learn the whole Torah off by heart. That's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. By the time you were 12, that's known the word of God pretty well, isn't it? So you got to the age of 12, you got those six years to learn five books of the Bible and be able to quote them off by heart. Even more incredible that there was even rabbis, considering there was only 3% of the population at the time of Jesus could read. Think about that. So how special was it for somebody to graduate from 6 and then from 6 to 12? And if they learnt that and they went before the rabbis and they passed the test and they seen that they had qualified to become a rabbi or to go into training with rabbi, they would come underneath another rabbi from the age of 12 through to the age of 30. And they would be schooled by that rabbi. And that rabbi would teach them his teachings or his understandings of the scriptures. And that was called the yoke of the rabbi. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, the teachings of Jesus. So if you want to know where Jesus was between the ages of 12 and 30, he wasn't out sawing wood. The Bible says that his dad was a carpenter. It never said that Jesus was a carpenter. He was being trained because at the age of 12, he was in the temple. And they said, where are you? He said, I'm about my father's business. Hello. Everywhere when Jesus later on in his life, they called him rabbi. Think about it. How would he have been able to walk into the temple after he went through the temptation in the wilderness and come out? How would have he been able to walk in the temple and just pick up the scroll of Isaiah and read it? You think anybody could just walk into the temple, pick up the scrolls and stand up there and read out of Isaiah? No, they couldn't. He was a rabbi. That's what he was doing from 12 to 30. He was underneath a rabbi and he was learning the scriptures so that he could step out and he was a rabbi. So when a rabbi would come and Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and here's these fishermen that are fishing there who obviously... the the reason they were fishermen is because they didn't make it through rabbi school. Hello? Otherwise, they would have been rabbis. They all, all those kids used to go through that training. And if you didn't make it through, you had to go and do another trade. And most of the time, you did your dad's trade. And so here were these guys that had been disqualified from being a rabbi or going to rabbi school or following underneath the rabbi that they thought, this is finished. I've been disqualified from this. And Jesus comes along, the rabbi, and says, come and follow me. Think about that. They left everything. They just dropped their nets and said, we've been disqualified from following a rabbi. But Jesus has just qualified us. Isn't that amazing? That's why their dad, that's why Zebedee didn't say, where are you guys going? We've got fishing to do here. He was just so blessed that a rabbi would come and say to his boys, come follow me. And they dropped everything and they went and followed him. Isn't that incredible? Doesn't that make sense? And they looked at Jesus and they followed the rabbi. 
See, the King James Version says it's like this. He said to them, come follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and just followed him. What an exciting day. They're thinking we're going to be fishing here for the rest of our lives, pulling up old dead mullet. We're going to smell like fish for the rest of our lives. Mend and nets. Is this all life has got for us? They had no idea that day their life was going to change forever because somebody was going to come by, a rabbi, and he was going to say, come follow me and I'll make you into something you never thought you could ever be. Isn't it great to have a saviour like that? That he can just walk into your life, into your situation and your circumstance and turn your life all around for the better. They would have never... Like if you could look back and Peter and James and John, if you're in heaven and you get a chance to talk to them when you're in heaven, you tell the stories and you say, would you rather be a fisherman or a follower of Jesus? I know what the answer would be. How much more exciting was their life? And I'm not putting fishermen down. If you're a fisherman and you're called to do that, praise God for you. Praise God for your wife if she likes you smelling like fish all the time. Hello? Hello? He said, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. See, there's one thing about this, about discipleship. He said, there's a key. He said, if you follow me, I will make you. Disciples just, I want to say today, disciples just don't happen to come. Disciples are made. Hello? He said, come, follow me and I will make you into a fisher of men. It's a process. It doesn't happen instantly. Just because you made a decision for Jesus doesn't mean you're a discipler. He said, you've got to learn. I've got to disciple you. I will make you into a fisher of men. Currently, you are a fisher of fish, but I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. You're going to be somebody that goes out and brings men into the kingdom of God. Talked about casting out your nets and drawing in a fish of all different kinds is what he talked about as a parable to them. They understood that. They'd been fishermen their whole life, so he spoke to them in terms that they understood. That's why it's no good walking up to somebody today and say, come follow Jesus, he'll make you into a fisher of men. They'll go, what? Jesus was using the terminology they understood. So there's a key to being a disciple of Jesus. One, follow me. Two, I will make you into a fisher of men. It's a work that he does in and through. There's another key here. Discipleship is found in the following. They only become disciples of Jesus because they left all to follow him. If they stayed and they didn't follow and they stayed fishing, would they have been disciples? No. The discipleship started in the following Jesus. He said, follow me and I'll make you into fishers. I want to say that followship is the, is the key to discipleship. Followship, not fellowship, that helps, but followship is the key to discipleship. Followship is a key to leadership. If you're unable to follow somebody else's vision, you'll never, God will never give you a vision of your own. Unless you can submit unto leadership, God, and follow somebody else, God will never ever release you with a vision of your own. Because followship always comes before leadership. Hello? Before any of our teachers that are here that teach in schools today, before they became teachers, they were all students. Did you realize that? Because they followed somebody else and were taught by somebody else and then they grew and they become teachers themselves where they could teach others. So followership is the key. If you're unable to follow another vision or submit to authority, you'll never be in a leadership position because followership always precedes leadership. See, the disciples became the leaders of the New Testament church. They had learned the art of fellowship. They walked behind their rabbi. And I talked about this a few weeks back, that they used to be able to dis distinguish who the disciples were and which rabbi they followed by their walk. You know why? Because they walked in single file. 
the rabbi would walk in front and he would take a stride. And as he walked, they would walk behind him. The disciples would follow him. He would be in front. The disciples would walk behind. And they would get used to his stride. They would get used to his walk. And the way he walked over walking for many, many days and weeks and months and years in the training period, they become to walk like their rabbi. And so people would look at him and say, he's a follower of Nicodemus, the rabbi. Because of the way Nicodemus walked, his disciples walked exactly the same way. So if you follow him long enough, you'll start to walk like the rabbi walked. My question today is, are you walking like the rabbi walked? Does your step stay in time with the master? Does it follow along the same line or do you veer off into other areas? That's what's called a trespass. Hello? Because you're veering off, off the path onto private property or another person's property or a place you shouldn't be. Amen? Are we walking like the master walked? Are we a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because if we are, our walk should look like his walk. I was thinking about this. This is a lesson we could all learn. Do you notice that when a rabbi would walk and they would walk behind him, John or Peter never ever ran in front of him and got ahead and started taking off on their own. They stayed behind the master. They walked in his way and they walked in his timing. Some of us will try and run ahead of the rabbi. He hasn't opened a door and we're trying to push a door open. We're trying to make a way. Wouldn't it be awesome if he could just learn to walk with the rabbi and not run ahead? Just to rely on his timing. Rely on him to make the way. Rely on him to lead the way. Because that's what the rabbi does and we're just followers of the rabbi. Do we walk like Jesus walked? Do we follow in his ways? Do we hold fast to his truths in the word? And his instructions, the words in red that are written in the Bible, do we obey those words and Jesus is teaching? See, that was a key to how Jesus discipled his disciples, how he taught them. And it's found in the book of Acts, and it's Luke talking about the book that he wrote, the book of Luke. Makes sense, doesn't it? Luke was a doctor, and Luke was very accurate at recording things. He was a very learned man. So if you read the book of Luke, it's got a lot more detail sometimes than a lot of the other books because he was so accurate in the way that he wrote things. He didn't miss things. And if we see in the book of Acts 1, 1 to 2, Luke says this when he, about the book of Acts and then about the book he wrote previous to that. He was talking to a guy by the name of Theophilus. I don't even know who that is and what, what he went on to do. But he said, in Acts 1, 1 to 2, he says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. He said, In my former book, I wrote about all Jesus began to do and to Teach. Hallelujah. There's a key in here. It's not just in the teaching, it's in the doing. Hello? He said, I taught about and I wrote about all Jesus began to do and to teach. You realize in the book of Luke, there's recorded 35 miracles. That's the doing. Amen? And he, Jesus told about 35 parables. That's the teaching. That's interesting to note, isn't it? There was as much application as there was teaching. And you know what Jesus taught? We're talking about religion this morning, and that we can just get into our religious habits. Jesus taught his disciples, but you'll notice every time he taught them to do something, he never did it the same way over and over. When he healed, he never did it the same way. You know what he said? I only do what my father tells me to do, and only say what my father tells me to say. He was teaching them to be led by the Holy Spirit spirit and be guided by the master hello come on he said I, I, it's all about what jesus did and what he taught 
See, Jesus discipled them by modeling it, by example. He showed them, not just opened a book and read it and said, this is how you're to live your life, but he modeled that lifestyle to the first disciples. He said, walk like me, follow me, see how I live, identify with me, come on, follow my ways, follow me. He wasn't just saying, follow me and walk along behind me. He was saying, follow the way I live this life and carry out this life. Because in it, you will find life and life to the full. Amen? Come on. Who's found life and life to the full since finding Jesus? Come on. It's the best life you can ever have, isn't it? I wouldn't trade it back for that old life or even 10 of them or even 100 of them. See, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Come to me, all you are weary and burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's the key again. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourself. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to say if we walk the way that Jesus walked, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're carrying a burden in life that's weighing you down, maybe it's time to take a note off Jesus and take that burden off. You've just got to give it to him and he will carry the weight of that. You don't need to carry it because he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His yoke was his particular teaching of the rabbi. The rabbi's teaching was his yoke. And today he wants you to follow his teachings. He wants you to walk in his ways, just like his first disciples when he called them he demonstrated it to them and even later on he talked Peter talked about it. he said not lording it over those entrusted you but being examples to the flock he was talking about if you're in a leadership position you're not there just to lord it over to people but you're there to be an example for those that are following you hello you know all every one of us are called to be leaders in the house of God in some capacity come on we are called to make disciples. See, James said it in a different way. He said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. See, it's not enough to know the word or know what G- how Jesus lived, but it's in the doing. It's walking like the rabbi walked. It's following after the master. That when you walk around town, or you even... even You know what? Isn't it really easy to walk like the rabbi when you're in church? Hello? I mean, somebody will say something nasty. You go, hallelujah, glory to God, praise God. Would you like prayer, da, da, da? Uh, Do we walk like the master at home? Do we follow in his footsteps? Do we walk like the master when we're in our car and somebody cuts us off? I heard a funny story once a guy was going to this big church in Melbourne he was telling me and he was preaching that morning in church and was driving to church next to this guy cut him off and he was in a hurry to get there he was going slow for a start and then he sort of cut him off and he got angry and he sort of leaned out the window and said what are you doing mate you know like I'm trying to trying to get something you know he got all angry yelled out the window and it was a massive church that they were going to and he's driving along and next minute he turned into the car park up this end and realized this guy turned in the car park at the other end that Sunday he was up there preaching from the front and that guy was in the congregation he just abused on the way to church. Do you walk like Jesus when you're actually driving the car or you're in your workplace? Or does your walk resemble somebody else like another worker or another person that's been part of your life or having an influence on you? Who is influencing your walk? Is it a worker or is it Jesus? See, it says in this scripture, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And after that, he gave us instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Think about that. Isn't that incredible? Why did Jesus find it so important that in that three and a half years that he was here, that he needed to be input into these disciples? These first people that he 
followers of his? Why did he find it so important that he needed to take them aside and just teach them and teach them and teach them, input into them, that he needed to model it for them, he needed them to grow? Because he realized he was not going to be there forever. He knew that God had called him to die on a cross of Calvary, to shed his blood for you and I, to display his great love for us, that we could accept what he did for us on the cross and have a relationship with God Almighty. He was preparing the disciples for this next season of their life. He was getting them ready for the next thing that he had called them to do. They were going to be the people that were going to take on and start the New Testament church and birth the church across this globe. He he knew he 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 only had a set amount of time, three and a half, four years, to minister into their lives. And then it was up to them to continue that walk. Because if he didn't do that, if he didn't disciple them, and they didn't grab a hold of those principles and the culture he was putting into them, the church would not continue you the next generation would not be walking for the Lord it would only finish with that generation if he didn't input and disciple them and grow them and apply that into their life and set an example for them it was vitally important for the next generations that he discipled them not with word but with action that it was modeled through his life that those that would follow him would walk like him. See, Jesus taught him about commitment, and it was commitment unto death. When he found out he's going to die on the cross, he was in the garden sweating drops of blood, and he said, God, not, if, not my will, but yours be done. That's commitment, isn't it? See, we can talk about commitment, but do we model commitment? Is football more important than church or God? Is work more important? I'm not, I'm not saying if you've got to work on this, I'm not, I'm not being critical here, but are the priorities right here? Come on. They model commitment. And you know what? Jesus was committed right up until they took his life. You know, the incredible thing is, even in that, he modeled laying his life down to the next generation. And you know what? 11 out of the 12 disciples did exactly the same thing. Laid their life down for the gospel. That's incredible to think, isn't it? How powerful is discipleship if we model it to the next generation? Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says this, Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What's that scripture called? Any missionaries? The Great Commission. Who's been called to make disciples? Uh, did it finish with James and John? Were the first disciples the only disciples? Like, done your job now? Pack up, go home. No, no, Jesus, before he went, he said, hey, come on, everybody. I'm sending you out to make disciples. You need a call. Just like I did, I called my first disciples and I modeled this lifestyle to them. I taught into them and I modeled it to them. Today I want to ask you a question. Who's your first disciples? Do you have any disciples? Is anybody following you? I want to say today, in the context of what I want to do in the rest of this service, is I believe our first disciples are our children. Hello? Hello? They're our first disciples that God's given us. You know what? We should be modeling how Jesus walked. That they might walk after him. You know why? Because if you're the next generation to continue on walking the way that Jesus walked, there's only one way they're going to do it, and that's if we disciple them by modeling it. That's our responsibility as parents. I believe before... 
I wouldn't say we get a chance to practice on our kids before we disciple anybody else. That's not what it's about. But the Bible does say train your kids in the ways of the Lord. It doesn't just say tell them. It says train them. Disciple them in the ways of God. When they're older, they'll not depart depart from it. It will not leave them. It will not go away from them. I want to say, if, if you've discipled Christ to your children, come on. You need to walk like the rabbi. So when you are no longer around, they still continue to walk like the rabbi. See, just as Jesus was preparing the disciples for the next season in their life, that's what we are called to do as parents, isn't it? Is to disciple our children. So we prepare them for the next season in life. Hopefully we are around, but we won't be around forever. But wouldn't it be good if our great-grandkids and our great-great-grandkids still walk like the rabbi? Wouldn't that be incredible? Because what the Bible says, it says the blessing of God goes on for a thousand generations. That's incredible, isn't it? Come on. And I'm not putting pressure on anybody here. I'm not saying if your kids aren't working for the, walking for the Lord right now, you failed, as a, you haven't discipled them correctly. No, no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you train a child in the way he should go, he will not depart from it, or it will not depart from him. I want to say that everything that you've taught into your children, maybe you weren't even a Christian, but now you're trying to walk the walk and show them the right way. That's all you can do. That's all God requires you to do. They're still responsible for their walk later on. As long as you've molded it, they know how to walk. They're just walking off the track at the moment. But you know what? They'll start to get in step with Jesus a bit later on because what you've put into them will never leave them. I can testify. I walked away from God for eight or nine years and I'd only been a Christian for three years before that. But I want to tell you, I could never run away from the presence of God. God was always there dragging me back, pulling me back, trying to get me back on that path, still trying to get me to walk on that right path. Come on, he never gives up on you. Hallelujah. And all we are called to do is be disciples and to teach them how to walk the next generation and disciple them, pray for them. Amen, come on. Jesus prayed for his disciples, didn't he? Come on, that's what we are required to do. Pray for our children, keep praying for them. There is nothing that can stop you from praying for your children. And I want to say today, it doesn't matter where your children are right now or what they're doing. If you've modeled Jesus Christ to them and you continue to pray for them, I want to say there's only one way they're going to go and that's they're going to come back into step and walk with the master you just got to keep praying for them amen come you've done your bit and it says they will not depart from it we've got a promise that we can stand on and we are here today to prepare the next generation and the generations that follow that they might walk the way that jesus walked hallelujah proverbs 22 6 says dedicate your children to god and point them in the way they should go And the values they've learned from you will be with them for life. Isn't that a great scripture? The values you've put into them will stay with them for life. You know what the Bible, what the not the Bible, but culture says when they're teaching culture and you're learning about culture and you're doing teaching on anthropology, we did this with missions. They say the culture of a child is put into that child by the time they're six. Where do you learn your culture from? Your parents. It's learned patterns of behavior of a particular tribe or group of people. So you learn your culture from your parents. You know how they learn it? Never by what you say, only by what you do. See, as a Christian, you can't use the old one. Don't do like I do, just do like I say. The kids will always do like you did very rarely like you said come on we need to be not to say you don't teach them we do but they need it to be modeled to them so we prepare them for life and we prepare them to prepare the next generation after them as well